Hi guys and welcome to another episode of Attorney Job Blogger, Law for the Everyday Layman. Today we'll be talking about legal versus illegal dismissal or termination from employment. If you like my videos and you want to see more, please hit the subscribe button. Please remember that this is only for educational and informative purposes and is not a substitute for proper legal advice or for studying and understanding the law. Okay, let's begin. Termination of employment has two aspects. Okay, we have termination by the employer and termination by the employee. Let's begin with termination by the employer. Termination by the employer is necessarily subject to statutory due process, which simply means that an employer can only terminate an employee for cause, with notice, and hearing. Okay? Now, this statutory due process in turn has two aspects. We have substantive due process and we have procedural due process. Substantive due process gives us the causes or the grounds by which an employer may terminate an employee, while procedural due process gives us the proper procedure which the employer must follow in order to validly terminate the employee. Okay? So let's begin with substantive due process. Under substantive due process, we also have two aspects. Okay? We have the just causes and the authorized causes. Let's begin with the just causes. Now, what are just causes? These are when the employee commits a wrongful act or omission for which the employer will be justified in terminating the services of the employee. Okay? Let's begin with the first ground. This is serious misconduct and willful disobedience to lawful orders of the employer. Let's have it in two. Okay? Serious misconduct refers to conduct that is so serious, no? And it must relate to the duties of the employee, so much so that the employee now becomes unfit to continue working for the employer. Some examples, no? When the employee gives threats or uh, utters swear words or bad words, no? Or fights on company premises. This is serious misconduct that will justify an employer to terminate the employee, okay? Now, what about willful disobedience to lawful orders of the employer? First, the employee must have willfully and intentionally disobeyed the lawful order of the employer. And how do we determine that? The employee must have been motivated by a wrongful or perverse attitude to not follow the order of the employer. Next, okay? The order of the employer must be reasonable, lawful, and made known to the employee. Okay? In other words, an employee cannot be faulted for not obeying an order which he did not know. Okay? Likewise, an employee cannot be faulted for not obeying an order which is prohibited by law. Okay? And finally, the order must be connected with the duties or work of the employee. Let's move on to the next ground. We have gross and habitual neglect of duties. When we say gross neglect of duties, this means that uh, there is a failure to observe the diligence which an ordinary man would exercise over his own affairs. It's ordinary diligence which the ordinary man has failed to exercise no now the habituality element may be disregarded okay only if the negligence is so gross or the damage is of such nature as to be so substantial as to have caused losses to the employer but as a general rule both the gross nature and the habituality of the neglect of duties must concur okay some examples would be habitual absenteeism or tardiness, no? So we can move on now to the next ground. We have fraud or willful breach of trust and confidence of the employer. Now fraud may exist and willful breach of trust and confidence will necessarily follow. Because if a person commits fraud, then necessarily trust and confidence is broken. The deceit involved is what causes the trust and confidence to be broken, okay? But breach of trust and confidence does not necessarily imply fraud because there can be other causes why trust and confidence might have been broken, okay? 
Now, with regard to fraud, fraud is never presumed. It has to be clearly and convincingly proven. And in case an employee has committed fraud where he uh, fails to uh, give all the money he is supposed to collect, and in case he returns it, such act of returning the money or restitution will not absolve him. He will still be guilty of fraud and the employer will still be justified in terminating the services of the employee. Why? Because the fraud has already been committed. The employer will no longer trust that uh, employee. Okay? Trust once broken is hard to repair. Okay? Now, as to willful breach of trust and confidence, the first requirement is that the loss of confidence is not simulated. It's not imagined. It's not made up or invented. Okay? Next, the loss of confidence must not be used as a subterfuge to circumvent the law on termination and post-employment. Okay? Next, it must not be exercised arbitrarily. Okay? Hindi yung trip lang ng employer. There must be a reasonable ground why the employer invoked this cause. Okay? Next, the employee must necessarily hold a position of trust and confidence. And he's not just a mere rank and file employee. Okay? Next, the uh, act must be work-related. Okay? Or it's in the performance of the duties of the employee. Now, is it necessary for losses to have been sustained by the company by virtue of the act? which caused the breach of trust and confidence, the Supreme Court has said no, losses are not necessary. As long as the trust and confidence has been breached, then it can serve as a ground to terminate the employee. However, the employer has the burden of proof to prove that the trust and confidence existed in the first place and that it has been broken. Okay? Next, let's move on to the cause of abandonment. An employee may be terminated on the ground of abandonment in the following, if the following requirements are present. Okay? First, the employee must have been absent without justifiable cause. Okay? It has to be like if he was sick, he has to tell the employer. Otherwise, he may be accused of abandoning the job. Okay? What's that's the first requirement? The second requirement is the more important one. There must have been a clear intent on the part of the employee to sever the employer-employee relationship. And how do we know this clear intent? It has to be manifested by some overt act. Okay? One example is probably when the employee takes home all of his things without telling the employer that he's no longer coming back to work. And there is a... a then we can infer that the employee no longer intends to come back to work because he has no longer ha have any possession in the company premises. No? Let's move on to another ground for termination of employment. We have what is called the Union Security Clause. Okay? This is a clause in a Collective Bargaining Agreement or a CBA which requires employees who are not yet part of any union to join the union which made that CBA. Okay? Now, in case that employee does not join that union, then the employer is justified in terminating the services of that employee. And the final ground under the just causes would be in case of a crime or criminal offense committed by the employee, against the employer, his immediate family, or his authorized representative. Of course, the employer cannot be compelled to retain the services of someone who has committed a crime against him, no? Okay, now with that, we can move on to the second aspect of authorized causes. If just causes were grounds wherein the employee committed a wrongful act or omission, here in authorized causes, these are grounds provided by law to justify termination even if the employee did not perform any wrongful act. First example, you will understand with this. No? What if the employer installed labor-saving devices? 
In this case, the employer is justified in terminating the services of the employee because the employer is now saving more on labor because of the new devices which he has installed. In such a case, if the employer terminates the services of the employee, then he has to pay the employee separation pay in either the amount of one month, one month's worth of pay, or one month for every year of service, whichever is higher. Okay? One month or one month per year of service, whichever is higher. Let's move on to the second ground. The second ground is redundancy. Okay, And this happens where the services of the employee are in excess of what has been demanded by the actual requirements of the enterprise. No? Sobra na. No? The employer has enough employees doing the work needed. Okay? The principle here is the employer is under no obligation to keep more employees than is reasonably necessary to operate his business, okay? But these are the requirements under the law. First, this cause must be exercised in good faith, okay? Second, the employer must have no other option. Third, the employer must give a notice to the employee and to the Department of Labor and Employment for at least one month before the date of intended termination and uh, in case uh, this ground is resorted to the employer must pay the employee separation pay in the amount of one month or one month for every year of service whichever is higher of the two okay finally there is uh, there must be observance of a reasonable criteria in determining who the employer will either retain or dismiss. Such a criteria can be efficiency, first in, last out, and other criteria, no? as long as they are reasonable. Now let's move on. The next authorized cause is retrenchment. Okay? Retrenchment may be availed of during business recession or industrial depression or uh, seasonal fluctuations in work or the decrease in the volume of work or lack of orders of the employer from its clients no? or let's say there's shortage of materials so the employer cannot uh, produce a high volume of output no? in this case the employer can retrench his employees however this is subject to the requirements of the law first it should be reasonably necessary okay next it must be duly proved okay the proof is necessary here what proof am i talking about it should be likely to prevent the losses which are feared no well uh, on one hand if the losses are already incurred then the employer can just simply uh, prove those losses which happened already but if the losses are uh, only foreseen the requirement of the law is such losses must be imminent or they will be happening very very soon okay likewise they must be proven to uh, be losses no next there must be notice similar to uh, redundancy there must be notice given to the employee and the employer one month prior to the termination of employment, okay? And uh, there will be payment of separation pay of either one month, but this time, uh, one month or one half month worth, uh, one half month's worth of pay for every year of service, whichever of the two is higher, okay? Of course, there must be good faith and reasonable criteria similar to redundancy reasonable criteria in determining who to retain and who to dismiss okay now let's go to the next uh, authorized cause now closure of business talks about either complete or partial cessation of the business of the employer okay it contemplates a shutdown of the business now this must be exercised in good faith it should not be exercised to circumvent the law on post-employment or on termination of employment. And the employer must have no other option 
than to, re to resort to a closure or cessation of business. Of course, notice must be given to the employee and to the Department of Labor and Employment one month, at least one month prior to the intended date of uh, termination. And in case the business is closed due to business losses, the employer does not have to pay separation pay. However, these losses must be proved. Okay? Why? Because the employer is not paying any uh, separation pay to the employees. So in order for the employer to not pay the separation pay, he must be able to prove that the company is suffering from business losses or financial reverses. But if the closure or cessation of business is merely due to the desire of the employer or for any other cause that is not business losses, then the employer will have to pay separation pay. And what is the amount? It's one month or one half month for every year of service, whichever of the two is higher. Okay? Now, let's go to the final authorized cause, which is disease. Okay? An employer may terminate the services of an employee who has a disease, but there are certain requirements of the law. Okay? First, the employee, of course, must have a disease. But this disease must have been certified by a competent public health physician, no? that it is not curable within six months even with proper medical treatment okay other requirements as his uh, the employee's continued employment is prejudicial to his own health or prejudicial to the health of his co-employees okay and final requirement is that notice must be given to both the employee and department of labor at least one month prior to the intended date of separation. In case the employer terminates the services of the employee on the ground of disease, the employer must pay the employee separation pay in the amount of one month or one half month for every year of service, whichever of the two is higher. So that's it for the authorized causes. We're done with the substantive aspect of due process. Let's move on to the procedural aspect of due process. This is very simple, no? The rule is simply two notices and one hearing. In terminating an employee, an employer must first give the first notice, no? Containing the offense of the employee, informing him of his right to a hearing, and asking him to prepare his defense. Then, after the first notice has been sent, a hearing will be conducted. Now, when we say hearing, it's not necessarily a trial-type hearing like the ones we see on TV or in the movies, okay? As long as the employee is given the right to be heard, even through papers, written uh, explanations, typewritten explanation, then the hearing requirement is complied with, okay? And finally, the second notice must be given to the employee informing the employee of the employer's decision to terminate the services of the employee. Okay, again, two notices and one hearing in between. Okay, now what if there are just causes that exist and procedural due process is not complied with? Is the termination valid? Yes, the termination is valid. However, the employer will be subject to pay nominal damages. Okay? In case the cost was a just cost, according to the case of Agabon versus NLRC, the employer will be paid, made to pay uh, nominal damages in the amount of 30,000 pesos. And in case of authorized causes, the case of Jaka Food Processing versus Pakot, says that the employer will have to pay nominal damages in the amount of 50,000 pesos. Okay? Now, what if there is no just cause but there is compliance with procedural due process? Then, of course, the termination is illegal. And especially if both just causes and the 
uh, uh, both uh, substantive due process and uh, procedural due process are not complied with, both are absent, then definitely the termination is illegal. Okay? So now, what are the reliefs in case uh, the termination is found to be illegal? First, the law tells us that there can be actual reinstatement. Meaning that the employee will be reinstated or returned to his old job or to a similar job in case his old job is no more is no longer available. In case the job is no longer available or in case uh, the employer insists on his claim, then the employee will simply be reinstated to the payroll. This is otherwise known as payroll reinstatement. Okay? Or in the third case, in case there are uh, strained relations, no? which means that the employer and the employee cannot work with each other anymore in any instance whatsoever, then in this case, there will only be payment of separation pay in lieu of reinstatement, which will uh, be uh, determined according to the circumstances of the case. Okay, but that's only if there are strained relations. Otherwise, there will be actual reinstatement or payroll reinstatement. Now, of course, during the period during which the employee was not working and was prosecuting his case, the employee will be entitled to back wages if he is found to be illegally dismissed. Okay? Back wages will include the actual uh, salary of the employee as well as allowances and benefits which uh, have been earned, which should have been earned during his time as uh, he was prosecuting the case. Okay? Now let's talk about this uh, concept of constructive dismissal. This is different from uh, all the causes for dismissal which I have previously discussed. In constructive dismissal, this is known as a dismissal in disguise. Okay? It is an act amounting to dismissal but made to appear as if it is not. That's why it's called a uh, dismissal in disguise. Some examples are involuntary resignation. No? When an employee is forced to resign or it is not within the will of the employee that he submitted his resignation letter. Okay? Another instance is when an employee is demoted. Okay? While an employer is free to transfer his employees, this must not be done with any discrimination and should not amount to a demotion. Okay? In case it is a demotion, then we can say there is constructive dismissal and the employee may be entitled to the reliefs for illegal dismissal which I have mentioned earlier. Okay? And the final example for constructive dismissal is discrimination. Okay? Discrimination will necessarily depend on a case-to-case -case basis, but here's the test to determine the existence of constructive dismissal. It is whether a reasonable person would have felt compelled to give up his position of employment. No? If you feel so uncomfortable or if you feel that it is necessary for you to give up your employment by reason of the act done to you by the employer, then it may be constructive dismissal. However, this will depend on a case-to-case -case basis. Okay? So, we're done with the uh, termination by the employer. Now, we can move to termination by the employee. Okay? Of course, the employee may terminate the employment relationship. And how can he do this? Okay? First, this is very common, by resigning. Okay? And when an employee resides, it's not necessary for him to state the cause why he is resigning. All that the law requires is that notice of resignation be given by the employee to the employer at least 30 days prior to his intended date of resignation. The law says at least. And the parties may agree that the notice may be given more than 30 days, such as 60 days, etc. No? Uh, second uh, ground by which uh, the employee may terminate the employment relation is when the employee does not, uh, does not even have to give notice. Okay? There are three instances. First, if there is serious insult on the honor or person of the employee 
committed by the employer. Now, what is a serious insult will necessarily depend on the circumstances of the case and the circumstances of the parties. Okay? And uh, second, no? Second is when there is inhuman or unbearable treatment by the employer or his representative upon the employee. Likewise, this depends on a case-to-case -case basis. Okay? And finally, a crime which the uh, employer commits upon the employee or his immediate family. Okay? And uh, let's just take this up while we're at it, no? A termination may be... Uh, a termination of employment may also happen through retirement okay retirement just has two concepts now we have uh, the optional retirement uh, and the compulsory retirement when we say optional retirement this is when a person who has reached 60 years of age may elect to retire from work okay in order to be entitled to uh, retirement pay such 60-year-old person must have rendered at least 5 years of service in the company. As for compulsory retirement, this happens when the employee has reached 65 years of age. Okay? And he will only be entitled to retirement pay if he has worked for at least 5 years in the company. And what's the value of the retirement pay? It is one, mo one half month one half month's worth of salary for every year of service okay again retirement pay is one half month's worth of salary for every year of service okay now the parties may agree no because uh, i said there's optional and there's compulsory retirement age no but the parties may agree that the service or the work of the employee may be extended even past retirement age but of course, both parties must freely agree to such an arrangement. Okay? So those are the basic principles on uh, termination of employment. I hope you have picked up a thing or two and I hope to see you in the next episode. Okay? Bye!